Okay. Um, can you all hear me okay in the back? Okay. I tend to do worse with a microphone than I do talking out loud. So, um, all right. So, my name is uh, Scott Horvath, and I work for the USGS. Uh, we are based out of Reston, but it doesn't matter because we're really kind of all over the country. Um, USGS is the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, and specifically, I work in our communications office on our digital services team. So we are responsible for doing a lot of management of our public facing and internal sites, uh, as well as some other um, stuff I'll just show in a moment. And I just kind of want to talk to you about building a robust community of content managers and sort of the path that we went down when we started doing this. Uh, this is sort of an, a broad overview of everything that we've that we've tried to be doing, we've tried to do over the last several years. Uh, it's not telling you what you should do or what you have to do or the products you should use or anything like that. It's just our experience, our path, our journey, and maybe you'll take away something from this that will be useful for your own uh, organization. So <clears throat> before I get started, because I do work for the federal government, I do have to show you this disclaimer that uh, any use of trade firm or product names is for descriptive purposes only and does not imply endorsement by the U.S. government. Okay. All right, so uh, for the agenda, I just want to kind of cover who we are uh, really briefly and our team. Uh, and then I want to give you the broad overview of the current state of how things are set up at USGS. And uh, then we'll kind of dive back into showing the background of how we got there, talking about our training and our community itself, um, our service center, which is JIRA-based, and our knowledge, uh, <clears throat> our knowledge base, which is Confluence, and uh, our CMS certification process and how that all folds into play. All right, so who are we? Uh, well, we're basically the science arm of the Department of the Interior, and so we pretty much do everything that it comes when it comes to earth science. Uh, so we do water, biological mapping, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, stream flow, coastal erosion, you name it, we do it. Um, so we really provide the data for organizations and agencies and the public and land managers uh, to use and make decisions. And so. Because we do so much, we are very big. And of course, when you're very big, everyone wants to have their own websites, which we have, uh, and we've had in the past, and we'll show you how we've been dealing with that. Um, specifically for me, I'm on our digital services team. So this is what we do. Uh, we manage our public-facing and internal sites, both are Drupal. Uh, Drupal 9 right now, going Drupal 10 this month, probably in the next few weeks. Uh, we manage our uh, back-end request system for the public. Uh, we also manage our Jira and Confluence environments within our office, and we also are responsible for our bureau-wide social media efforts. So since 2007, I've been the social media lead for USGS, uh, and in about four days, I will no longer be that social media lead. I will also, uh, but we'll have another person coming on board. Um, and we also are responsible for managing the communities that come with all of those groups. <clears throat> all right, so let me kind of give you the current lay of the land for you at USGS and how we do stuff. So a lot of what we do, at least uh, from our perspective, starts with policy. So we basically have a policy that says, and we're talking about the content management community here. Uh, we have a policy that says if you want to have access to the site to uh, create content, manage it, you know, it's a major responsibility uh, for an employee, uh, you have to pass this CMS certification course. And so once someone takes that course and they pass it, they get pushed on to uh, Drupal training. And we provide Drupal training for all of these uh, individuals. Once they pass our Drupal training, um, they're content managers, and they get access to our service center. So our service center is JIRA-based. Uh, and so with our service center, they have access to documentation, FAQs, how-tos, tutorials, videos, you name it. Um, they can look up all kinds of things and to help them do their jobs. And they also have the ability to submit tickets to us um, through the front end interface into our JIRA back end so we can handle those tickets. And so when we get tickets for our, from our content managers, um, oh, my animated GIF is going, look at that. Uh, well, there was a cat on the keyboard banging real quick. Everyone's probably seen that. But we handle that, those tickets really quickly. Um, that is our job and provide good customer service. And a lot of times we glean information from our tickets, from the problems that our content manager community is experiencing. We also have new features and things that we roll out. So we put all of that stuff into our knowledge base, which is based in Confluence. Our knowledge base serves our service center, the front end for our content managers. It also serves as the base for our training. So as we are doing documentation, updating stuff, our training is always up to date. 
our service center is always up to date. Our content manager community is always up to date in terms of where that inf what the information is that they need. And that just kind of allows us, again, to kind of continue, uh, provide continuous training and support for our community. Uh, so another part of our community is the current state of things. So we have uh, 300 and so user accounts in our community. Uh, we have about 230 or so are actual content managers. There's a few other roles that we have. Uh, 200 are active within the last 30 days. Might seem like a large community to some, uh, to others might not, but it is a far cry from where we were last year, and I'll show you some numbers on that a little bit later. Uh, we have more than, almost double that uh, as members in our Drupal CMS Teams channel. So we do use Microsoft Office uh, and Teams to collaborate. So we have our supervisors in there, we have managers of these microsites that we manage. Uh, we have a little over 500, or roughly 500, individual microsites under one umbrella. So we have usgs.gov slash whatever. All of these microsites are completely separate, but they're all part of the same platform. They all leverage COPE, so creating once and publishing everywhere. So uh, someone can create a piece of content and tag it to multiple microsites, but all those microsites still function individually as themselves, which is a huge, a huge undertaking for us, uh, and it's, it's been a massive win for our organization. Um, from a communications perspective, from a community, there's a lot that we do, but these are sort of the highlights of things that we like to do. Uh, we are always doing meetings with our content managers. We have a monthly meeting where we recap everything that went on in the past month. We have a weekly hub call right now. It's actually happening at the moment. Um, we have, which is just ask, ask, ask any question, you know, show us what you've been doing. Let's talk about 80s music and trivia because you know we just love talking about all kinds of different things. Uh, we do monthly smart analytics meetings. So we have someone on our team who's dedicated to analytics and um, she does this monthly meeting uh, with all of our content managers. We do advanced training sessions with them. Uh, we have uh, monthly newsletters. We communicate constantly. We're always providing updates to our folks. Uh, we do regular announcements internally on our site uh, through our Teams channel. We share plain language tips that we get from other folks and other agencies. Uh, and we document everything that we do. And we kind of take that to the extreme. Um, so any work we're doing, any documentation, any new features, whatever it might be, we document, 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 share, share, share. Uh, and so that's kind of how we... Yet yeah, we just have to constantly communicate with people to kind of keep them up to date with what's going on. So we've been doing this for, um, and I'll get into the details, but we've been doing this for about since 2015. Uh, and the real question is like, we put all this energy and work into this stuff, has it really done something? Has it really result, uh, resulted in an actual improvement? And we, we believe so, it actually has. So. Um, these are our customer satisfaction scores. These are the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And the government scores from 2017 are on, are in the blue. And they were plateaued around 73, and then they dropped down to 66 um, in FY22. Uh, our scores are in green. We went from 67 to 76 over the course of those same years. So we've improved, you know, nine percentage points. Uh, that's great. We want to go further. Uh, but it's a testament to building this community and strengthening it and providing a tool that is consistent, that provides, you know, microsites and creates all this content that looks consistent, it's all standardized, uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of build content in this environment. And the same thing with our satisfaction scores, just from a USGS perspective. Um, that's a little cut off, but that's FY17, 71 points to 81 points. So. Just goes to show that like what we're doing is working, uh, and so we've just hopefully the trend the trend will continue upward. All right, so I kind of want to get into the background. Now. So we didn't get here overnight. It was a lot of pain, a lot of work, and I don't know where certain folks organizations are at in the process. I knew that someone had mentioned that they're at the very beginning. They're looking at Drupal. Um, other folks are probably halfway through. So this is kind of where our experience has been, and maybe you see yourself in this. Maybe this will help. Um, we were on the web in 94. Uh, we launched our Drupal 7 site in 2016. And we experienced all of this, uh, all of these things uh, during that time. So we had 500 individual subdomains uh, within our organization. 
and everything was disconnected, right? Everyone labels things differently, a lot of duplication, lack of web strategies, a lot of, I just want to build a website, I'm going to create it, and no sort of control around that. Uh, lack of consistent tools and technologies, position overturn. Uh, from our perspective, you know, from a policy side of things, lots of policies, hard to enforce those policies when you've got so, such a decentralized environment. Um, and all that creates a disjointed user experience for people, uh, results in low, back, low scores, low satisfaction in search scores. And then you bring in, this is all before mobile, right? You bring in mobile and you're like, how do we get 500 sites to be all mobile friendly? It's pretty much an impossible task. So we knew we had to do something. And so we were like, okay, great. Let's have a big meeting with a bunch of people across our organization and everybody's input into this, into this conversation. We knew we had to change the web, uh, and we, we just didn't know how to get there just yet, but you know, we, we were gonna do something about it. So we started in 2012, and yes, we did start a 50-person team, which I don't know if anybody's had a 50-person team, but it's not always the most effective. Um, we had lots of opinions. Everyone's a developer or a UX or UI expert, communications expert. We had lots of spin-off teams that did things, but sometimes they were just completely disconnected from what we were trying to do from the broader picture. Uh, we had some groups that just didn't want to do what we wanted to do. We knew we had to go to a CMS. Uh, we knew we needed to build a community, but some groups just wanted to keep doing what they were always doing because they felt okay with that. And so there was a lot of internal cultural issues, other priorities, and the big thing for us also is that we didn't have funding. This was all volunteer, right? It was a community of practice, basically, within our organization. Uh, and so there was really no teeth to doing it. And so we did this for two years. Uh, and then in 2014, we said, we have to stop, because this isn't going anywhere. We gotta change the way we do things. Uh, we started a uh, CMS focus group within our communications office, and we got approval from our leadership to do this and to what, do whatever it takes to make a CMS available for the entire organization. Uh, we took that charge on, and we did a lot of high-level strategy and planning. We researched every single site and every single page that we had across those 500 subdomains and built our information architecture, used analytics and all kinds of information to do that. Um, we were developing a Drupal 7 prototype at the same time, so this is back in 2015. And then as soon as we had that prototype, we did a roadshow where we took it out into the field and we actually presented it to different centers across our organization. Uh, and as they were, you know, as we're doing it on this roadshow and they were seeing the prototype, we were changing the prototype, we were building new things. Um, and we were also identifying early adopters. If anyone is looking to build a community from scratch, find early adopters, people in your organization that are trusted people that will sing the praises of what you're building and bring it to those um, in folks in the field. Because when headquarters says, thou shalt use this tool, there's a lot of pushback. When your colleagues are like, we gotta use this tool because this is the best thing that we've had, then they wanna use it. Uh, so always identify early adopters. Um, we always kept our leadership up to date and we were also planning internal site uh, for using it uh, for Drupal as well. Um, and we, import, most importantly, we secured funding for all of this. So, we did a lot of work within a two-year time period to get to where we are, to, to just to get to kind of go where we, are to, where we are today. All right, so that was 2014 to 2016. Now, a big part of our community, of course, is training people and then making sure they're knowledgeable about what we do, about what's available, the tools that are around. And so we knew early on that we had to do training for this community that wasn't, it was kind of growing, but it wasn't really solidified yet. And so we started doing training um, back in 2015 when we were still developing a prototype and going on a roadshow. So as we were selling this product to leadership and to other groups and telling them, we want you to use this, here's the benefits of this, we were still building that prototype. We were still changing it. And then we were training people on it. And so training was very dynamic back then. Um, so 2015 to 2017, we traveled across the country once a month, flying on a Monday, train for three days in person, eight hours a day, sometimes longer, and then fly back out on the front. And usually we'd have three or four of us that would do that. Um, the benefit of all that stuff was that we made connections and we were able to build trust with people in person. I think someone, there was another session I was in and they were like, you know, you lose a lot of that trust, that connection stuff when you're not in person. 
Uh, if you're looking to do this and you're rolling out a new product, a new CMS, uh, and you're trying to get people involved, do it in person if you can. Train in person if you can. Bring people on board. Uh, those connections were really powerful for us and vital to all the rest of the work that we've been doing with our community. Um, but of course, the disadvantage is that it's costly. 2018-2021, uh, this is kind of like after we launched our first uh, Drupal 7 site in 2016, uh, we converted all of our training to online training. Same time period, all of that. Uh, the reason that we primarily converted to virtual was because we needed more time to continue developing more products. We're a five-person team, uh, and there's just not a lot of hours in the day for us to do all the work that we need to do. So moving into an online training, not having to travel, saves a little bit of energy and time. Uh, we were able to support more time zones doing that virtual training, but the big disadvantages were that we did lose all a lot of that personal face time. And it was still time consuming for us as trainers, we were sitting on a video call for eight hours a day, which is a struggle uh, for a lot of people. Uh, nowadays, back in, uh, so we started in 2021. Again, as we're progressing, we're moving more toward Jira and Confluence for a lot of things with our content manager community. We uh, started doing more self-trained. So we did a hybrid model, uh, and we still do this to this day. But we basically do five days a week, which seems like a lot, but it's really not because we'll do a 30-minute session in the morning with an instructor-led sort of training, introduce people to what's going on for that day. And then we have self-training throughout the rest of the day. We have our training in Confluence, and it's based off of a tool called the Izzy module. Uh, this allows us to build a self-training style format um, uh, process for our content managers, and they can just sort of you know read, click, whatever, we can also track all the, all the work that they're doing, how far they've gone. You can add lab work in there, all sorts of things. So it's all self-training throughout the day. And then we do 30 minutes at the end of the day, instructor-led, to kind of recap what we, what we talked about. We go over lab work that people did. Um, so we're working, we're training these folks, we're talking to them. Uh, and by and large, this has been the most popular type of training with um, our community. Uh, they love the fact that it's self-paced. Uh, they just have to complete all the work by the week's end. And we use a whole entire mock site for them. So we, whatever we have in the current site in production, we spin off into a training environment. And then they are actually working in that environment. They can do whatever they want to do, break whatever they want to break, and not, not have any problems. Um, it's less stress on us as well as, as, a, as a, a team. And the benefit of the training, because it's all based in Confluence, it's always up to date with whatever documentation we have currently out there. Any changes to features, it's all pulling from that same documentation. Uh, there are disadvantages, of course. Not everybody learns the same, so we do this mixed instructor versus self-training process so that we can have some of that in-person training if we need to. Uh, and we also do, um, we have a Teams, uh, Teams channel set up. So, Every single time that we do this uh, training with our content managers, we have a week uh, a channel that we set up just for the week where those folks are invited into the channel and if they have questions or problems, they can always just ask us. We can do screen sharing, whatever it might be, to kind of help them out. So this is sort of like the, the, the journey of our, our training and how it's evolved over time. Uh, just really quick, what this training looks like for our folks. So uh, we have a, we use JIRA for our, um, our, our back end, but also for the service center. So it's a bolt on basically to JIRA. And they sign up for training with a uh, request form. The, the request comes into our JIRA environment. And we use this as a way to track all their learning throughout the entire week. So we have an entire workflow set up so that we know when, uh, you know, we can check their work and say, okay, they've passed lab one, lab two, lab three. Uh, we can provide comments to them and feedback on how they're doing. And so this becomes their uh, record of learning uh, within our system. And they'll always have access to that ticket um, in their own view as well. Cost savings, uh, huge for us. When we started in-person training with our community, we were spending 1,200 hours a year, which is expensive. And uh, for self-training, we're now spending 148 hours per year with five people. So huge cost benefit to us, to the organization, uh, and it's less stress on everybody. All right, so a couple slides about strengthening the community. So 
there's a lot that you have to do to keep a community running. You build it, keep it energized, um, just kind of keep people involved and so they don't check out. There's a, there's a lot that goes into it. I can't possibly go through everything. But um, there's a few, few key things that kind of help to get the community going. Uh, and I just kind of want to go through those now. So as I mentioned, choosing early adopters. We have folks that were uh, building their existing sites in this Drupal 7 prototype. They knew that it was going to get all screwed up and changed and everything. But when they did that, we would show those prototype version sites to our uh, folks in person. So on every single training, we the last day, we would have those early adopters present their own sites. And they said, oh, you know, this is great. You know, there's a little bit of changes here and there, but I love it because it's so easy for me to create content. That really helps solidify selling that content management system to our community um, as it was growing. Also to our leadership. Leadership was kind of not always on board with like, I don't know if this is the right thing to do or, or the right direction we should be going in. But as the community started singing more praise about, the, about it, the leadership heard about it and they were fully on board. Um, we started very, very early in 2015, before we even launched our site uh, initially with uh, building our community. So monthly community meetings, um, we had a lot of spin-off meetings, anything that we need to do to help the community pr uh, progress, we, we did. Uh, we post everything internally on our site, all of our documentation. Uh, we set up web workshops every year. We host a web workshop for our entire community. Sometimes it's in person, sometimes it's virtual. But uh, we always talk about the future of the web, what's coming down the pipe, kind of prepare them for those big efforts and changes that are going to happen. Uh, we always have a way for people to contact us and uh, internally at least and have a conversation, meet all the other content managers, help each other out. So we use Microsoft Teams for that. Uh, after we launched in 2016, we got approval from the leadership to require mand mandatory migration of all other sites into this CMS. We knew that we were going to move, move there. Uh, we didn't know when. It took about three years for folks to get all of those sites into our CMS. But it happened uh, because leadership backed us. Uh, and then the other part is that, you know, I mean, leadership was always um, on top of like who had moved their sites and who hadn't. Uh, we sent out monthly newsletters. We still do that to this day. Uh, another important thing is we brought on detail leads. So we brought people from the field into uh, our team sort of to see how the sausage was made. And they would do like three months stints with us. Uh, and a couple of them actually stayed and now they're full-time employees on our team. Uh, and so that, that really kind of helped out uh, a lot as well because they could go back to their, their centers and they would say, I know a little bit more about how this works and you know, it's really a good thing that we're, that we're doing this. So uh, a big push for us was in 2019 where we started providing more options for the community to help themselves. So I guess, I, as I mentioned, we were um, very busy building more, con building more things, more features, and we needed more options for the community to kind of help themselves. So this is where we started moving toward our service center, uh, and which I'll talk about momentarily here. Uh, and the big thing, just takeaway, is like communicate with your content managers. When you're done communicating with them, you're not done. You have to keep communicating because they forget things. I always like to tell people, um, you know that McDonald's has the Big Mac, right? You know it's been there for ages. You're never going to forget. But you still, to this day, McDonald's will talk about the Big Mac on a radio commercial or TV or somewhere. It's not that they don't want you to forget it. It's just that it's. I mean, they do, but. It's always there, it's always ever present, and they're always talking about it, so it just doesn't leave your mind. So it's the same kind of thing with communicating, uh, you know, what you're doing with your community, talking to them, uh, things of that nature. Always keep them up to date. All right, uh, let me talk a little bit about our service center. So this is kind of where our community comes together in terms of documentation and content and help. So. Uh, our service center is, is a, an add-on to the JIRA environment. So uh, previously we were working in JIRA and we needed a, a, basically a front end to add on to, to give uh, content managers access to the documentation in our knowledge base. And so uh, this service center talks directly to our knowledge base. And so when they come to our service center, they can submit tickets uh, for common requests that they don't have access to do. But this 
big search field in the middle of our service center allows them to do look up of documentation. So it's auto-suggest uh, if you're looking like how to upload an image or uh, you know latest updates to the CMS or whatever it might be. Uh, we provide all that information. It's just uh, served to them through auto-suggest and that all comes from that, that knowledge base of ours. So in 2019 is when we moved started moving all of our documentation into a knowledge base in Confluence. And then in 2020, we ended up bolting on that service center. And when we launched, um, that's kind of like where we are now. So uh, the, like the benefit of this, is that, as I mentioned before, all of our information is stored in that knowledge base. And so uh, we know that when people come to look for something, they're always getting the most accurate information, the most up-to-date information because we're putting it into the, to the knowledge base. <clears throat> so why use Jira and Confluence for us? Um, it was a no-brainer. Uh, we were already working with our developers in Jira prior to all this. Uh, we were also working in Confluence to document all of our CMS requirements, our features, things of that nature. And so we saw the benefit of this for our content manager community. And again, it kind of goes back to wanting to empower the community to kind of help themselves. Uh, the next line is kind of reason, one of the reasons why. So we were using a shared inbox, email inbox, for many, many years. Um, and it's hard when you have five people in an inbox and you don't know who's doing what, what's going on. You've got color labels all over the place. You've got different folders and people want to organize stuff the way they want to organize it. Um, we couldn't do that anymore. And we had to track all the work that we're doing because leadership wanted to know what we're doing. What you know? I'm paying you all this money to run this stuff. Show me, show me, you know, I, you know, show me the numbers. So uh, we moved to that self-service model uh, with the trick, the, the tickets, and the troubleshooting, and the knowledge base, because we also need to track all the work that we were doing and all the work that people were asking us for. Uh, and so to this day, we don't use email for our community. Uh, we use Jira. Uh, people go to Jira. Uh, we do a lot of meetings and things of that nature, but we're out of the email business. Um, from our perspective, that's a huge win, and we can track everything that we do now. Um, again, we needed to do more product management, and we needed to track the analytics on how we're doing things and how much the community is asking of us. Uh, so these, all these analytics, uh, we use everything uh, for tracking all of our work. Uh, we have a service level agreement set up with our community. So we basically say, you know, within a one to three time day uh, time period, we're going to respond and resolve your question, uh, whatever it might be. Sometimes we can pass those off uh, and make those dates a little bit later. But we track the status of every piece of work that comes into us uh, from the community. Uh, we respond to the community uh, when they submit stuff for certain things, like this is a video submission. Uh, we, they can tell us where they want this video to be tagged and which microsites it should show up on. So we can help them with that. Uh, we do all the back and forth conversation in here. So we get a full history of like when they submitted the ticket, how long it took to resolve, um, you know, the status, uh, you know, who, who was added onto it. They can add their supervisor to it if they want to, everything. Um, and then for us, from a government perspective, we use all these analytics that come out of JIRA to serve our EPAPs. So every year we have those performance awards, awards performance evaluations, um, and we have to provide numbers. And so we get our numbers from Jira uh, and a few other places. Um, so for one example, you know, this might be, this is uh, our resolution time for tickets. You know, we have to hit a certain threshold in order to meet whatever criteria it is. And so for getting an excellent, let's say, or outstanding. And so we know as a team that if we don't perform, um, we're not going to get that good rating. Uh, and so it's a, incumbent upon us to make sure that we're working with the community, talking to them, helping them out, resolving tickets, uh, and being there for them uh, in order to also help ourselves uh, in the long run. Okay, <clears throat> so our CMS certification course. So we had the community growing for a while. Uh, and then back in 2021, you know, we started realizing that there's a lot, there's a lot of things that uh, content managers don't really know right off the bat. Because our content managers are employees, and they come from all parts of life, walks of life within the organization, uh, and they're not really, they're not necessarily all web people, right? Uh, I'm a guy been on the web doing web stuff for 
ages. And uh, you know, they just don't know the things that we know. And so we're, we had to find a way to kind of instruct them about um, all of those policies and requirements and everything that are uh, out there. So what we ended up doing is we created um, a policy to talk about the requirement to take a CMS certifications course. Uh, what this certification course does, and you can see this policy online right now if you were to go to it, just look up USGS 601.2. Basically, it does three things. Um, it requires that any person that needs access to the CMS has to take this certification course. Uh, the course has to be taken every single, every single year in order to retain access, and it provides mechanisms for removing access if you don't take that course. Uh, what this course does is it kind of goes over um, just the, from a 30,000 foot level, right? The high level federal agency, bureau, and CMS specific policies and laws and requirements and guidelines and everything that uh, a web content manager needs to understand. And so we don't dive into the details. We sort of say, here's what the policy is. Here's the broad overview of the policy. It's incumbent upon you to understand what this is. You need to make sure you read it. Uh, you need to, you know, and the other part of this too is that while they're getting this broad overview, we talk about these things with our content manager community in more detail during meetings. So we'll have conversations about different policies. And it at least introduces those requirements at a minimum every single year. Uh, it helps us to restrict access to that CMS based on the policy, because those that actually want to have access will take that certification course. And it's not a hard course, it's just something you have to do. Uh, and it improves security for us by reducing unnecessary accounts. And um, I'm also responsible for doing our ANA certification requirements every single year from a security perspective. So this also helps us to address some of our controls in those uh, yearly requirements. <clears throat> uh, basically, the kind of way this works for us, we run this course between May and July of each year. It's just the time period we picked. Uh, Everyone is required to take it during those three months, and we start communicating this in January. And I will tell you that no matter how much you communicate something and tell them to do it, they will still forget. Um, and people will still, still come to us at the end of July and say, I've lost access to my page, I don't know what's going on. And we're like, did you see the monthly meetings and the PowerPoints and the documentation and the news announcements and everything else? So. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. You know, it, it'll take you so far. Um, but so we we talk about this. We explain what's going to happen if you don't do this. Uh, and then in May they start taking that course. Now uh, we host this just through our talent system, our DOI training talent system that we have at, across all the Department of Interior. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Download the materials, read it, take a quiz, get 100%, uh, and then you're set until the next year. Uh, again, this is just sort of introduces, and I can and I can tell you that when people started taking this course, we we first launched it in 2022. When people took this course, they were telling us afterwards, they were like, "I had no idea that you had to do all of that stuff." And and some people actually dropped out from being a content manager. They were just like, "That's that's a lot of responsibility. I don't really know if I want to do all that." So um, it, it does do some of that as well. Uh, Similar to the training, we used to host this in our Confluence environment using that Izzy module um, for more self-paced, but uh, we found that it was a little bit easier just for this particular course to do it in the way that we're doing now in, um, in our training environment. Okay, so some of the results from our 2022. This is the first year that we launched. Prior to certification implementing that, we had 2,700 accounts in our system. That's a lot of accounts. We had people since 2016 that were in that system either editing stuff or maybe they had an account and hadn't been in there for several years. Um, we needed a way to clean them out and only keep the ones that actually were need, needed access. After certification, we had 86% reduction in accounts. Uh, and we're still around that range today. And so these are the folks that we know are active content managers mostly. There are some folks that might be in there once a month. That's okay. Uh, but you know the majority of them, I would say I would say there's probably 200 of them that are in there at least once a week doing changes to the site um, so this is a was a massive security win for us uh, and just a massive headache like a stress relief from all the accounts that we had in the system um, 
And of course, we use feedback to kind of help build our 2023 course, which is where we're at now. And uh, that one just ended. Um, new people that come into the organization, they can take this course at any time. That's fine. Uh, but even if they come in in April of that year and they take the current version in May, they have to take the next version because the next version changes whatever policies are around at that time. So we do update with new policies. All right, last two slides. Um, so repeating this model. So we use JIRA, we use Confluence for our content manager community. And so far, this has been a huge benefit for us. They've loved it. Um, our leadership loves it because they like to see the numbers, the data. Um, they like to see that our team is performing well. They know that we perform well. Uh, and we can track all that stuff and we can tell them exactly how well we're doing or how well we're not doing. So they wanted to repeat that for the rest of the office. Our team became a little bit of a hated team because of this. Um, <laughs> but it's going to have more benefit to it and, and it's going to help out. So now we're actually repeating this whole model. So um, we, are, we have implemented JIRA and Confluence environments for, uh, and projects for our internal uh, content manager system uh, folks, for our bureau social media team. Uh, there's training involved with all that, again, using that same module that we have. Um, our public affairs staff, internal, budget staff. All these folks are now moving into the JIRA environment. They have their own JIRA projects where they can all talk, you know, do the things that they need to do. But we're able to bring all that stuff together now into a central location for the office to see broadly everything that's happening on any time of day across all of this, all of these teams. That's huge. Uh, and that's something that, you know, that they haven't been able to do before. <clears throat> um, and it really kind of gives you a sense of, of all the work that's actually being done. And so the other thing that we do for our, uh, so just for ourselves is we each have our own uh, JIRA project boards. So for our own personal tasks that we do during the day. So if we have something that has to be done, someone asks for work, the boss says, hey, go do this. Um, we create a task for ourselves on our own JIRA project and we can track this. Uh, and so at the end of the mid-year you know, mid or at the end of the year, um, we pretty much have like a one-click option. So we can just click and export all of our, uh, our, our epics, which our epics are equal to our performance elements. And we have tasks under each one of those epics. And so we can export all that out, copy, paste, drop it into the performance system, we're done. Right? We don't have to go through the struggle of like, oh, what did I do back in January? And how many meetings did I have? It's, it's all in our JIRA, JIRA environments. Um, this is a huge cultural change, cultural change for us and for others um, when they want to adapt this sort of model because documenting everything you have to do and then tracking everything you have to do is not just common for a lot of folks. They, um, they just like to do things and get it done and then just kind of write it on the whiteboard and they forget about it and they go back to it later at some point when they remember. Uh, with this, we can track it all and we don't have to try to remember everything. Um, but this is just one added benefit of being in a Jira environment. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, is there any questions? Yes. Uh, what, with that large of an editor base, what, if anything, do you do about content quality? Meaning, voice and tone, yeah. plain language, accessibility when yeah. they're interacting and maintaining their site. Yeah, <laughs> that's a struggle. Um, so I will say that we, we do a lot to kind of uh, instruct people on plain language tips. We try to share as much information as possible about, um, you know, the latest, you know, whatever it might be to help, kind of help them fix their content. We do have some restrictions on some of the content editing. So, uh, you know, you can't create a table without it actually having a header row. It's forced on you. Um, we don't allow the tables to have, for example, no borders. You gotta have a border on tables. That forces people to not use it as a layout function, but more as like an actual data function. Um, so there's some little things that we do there. Uh, there are some restrictions on certain types of links for certain types of products that we have that we enforce. So you can't link off to just random things. Uh, you know, we don't really have a bureau-wide tone or voice that we have. We're, we're sort of, I, I guess it would best, best would be like, um, you know, we're just providing the data, we're informational. 
Um, there's nothing exciting about that. But, uh, you know, that'll change. Um, there's some things underway that's going to improve that. But that'll be still going to be a struggle uh, as we get those new changes coming, how to keep people informed about um, all of that, all of those new tones and the new tone and new voice and everything. But with 300 people, that makes it hard. Um, maybe one day we'll get less content editors, content managers. Maybe it'll be more focused. That would be a bigger goal for us, I think. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what, what happens. Uh, yes. You mentioned that cultural shift. Yeah. Um, did you get any blowback from that or resistance, or how did you, how did you deal with all of that? Actually, no, just, nobody. Did you just fire all those people? I love Or how did you get past all that? I, I would say that the, the biggest thing that we struggled with when going from, you know, everyone has their own subdomain and website going to a CMS was I'm a developer, are you going to take away my job? Because now you're not developing anymore. You're just putting in content to a form field, and the system does its own thing. Uh, so no, we we explained to them that you know, entering content into a form and being a content manager is much more difficult than what you think. Um, you need to know a lot more, a lot more policies and things of that nature. We did explain to them that guess what? You're not going to have to do security every year. You're not going to have to worry about making sure the uh, the sites run in properly. It's up to date, whatever it might be, because that's taken care of for you. Um, you're not going to have to worry about the latest JavaScript framework or whatever's going on. Like you know, I know that you, some people like to do that. Um, I, you know, I built web applications myself for a long time and way back in the day. Um, but you know, there's a lot of that extra stuff that we took off people's shoulders. And when they realized that they were not losing their job, um, it was just shifting how they did their their day. But most people were actually okay with that. Uh, there are some folks that started to do web application development for other parts of the organization. Um, our site is pretty much all of the, if you go to usgs.gov, it's pretty much all of, the majority of stuff is, is the static websites that came in, but we do have some web uh, applications that have moved into that environment because we will build a tool that can be applied for everybody. And so everybody gets that nice mapping feature that everyone else is building. We provide it to all 500 sites you know, in an instant now. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit of change. A lot of there was a lot of cultural change and some blowback from, from folks. You know, not everybody wanted to play in the sa in the one sandbox because the site all looks the same, right? It's the same color scheme everywhere. Um, you know, if you see uh, navigation, you'll always see multimedia, about, data, pro uh, publications. It's all named the same thing on the side and on the top. So. Uh, you know, having that structured labeling and all that was a big change for people too. Uh, we do science at USGS. We have a science section. People don't want to call it science. They want to call it projects. They want to call it activities. They want to call it whatever. Um, so having to standardize on that term science was very hard to do. Uh, and so there was some pushback on that too. I mean, it's just, there was a lot of that. Uh, but we, we got there, so we're good. Uh, Okay, let's just start here in the front. Hi, right, go ahead. <laughs> um, I've heard you talk about every year you kind of require them to retrain, you know, like refresh training yeah. um, mm -hmm. for the CMS, yeah. uh, manage content manager. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any uh, policy or any workflow kind of thing to uh, enforce the content review of process? Because, you know, the content, especially if you deal with yeah. development, like the policy changes. Yeah. You know, some content was relevant before, but mm -hmm. not anymore, or you know, some update needs to be happening. So how do you man manage that? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting because the content that is created on the site is still managed by the leadership within the centers. And we have, I don't know, 50 some odd centers, but then there's all these individual sites that spin off from those things. And so we don't control what they're putting up in terms of the content itself. That responsibility has been delegated down to the center directors. Um, we're trying to impart upon all those folks that there are some levels of responsibilities that you have if you are operating in the CMS. Uh, and that's really how we see our job is to kind of just keep them informed and say, you know, you used to do this, and this is what you said. You can't say that anymore. And so, you know, uh, there is a, a little bit of a learning challenge there, I think, um, 
because we don't control that content. Uh, you know, in a grand world, we would have a dedicated team of content managers that were all on the same team and that were all trained up nonstop on everything and, you know, um, and knew all the rules and the policies and everything. Uh, but that's just not reality within our organization. We have just a lot of people. So um, maybe we'll do something different at some point. <laughs> uh, next, yes? I actually had almost the same question. Uh, when you have material that is new, sometimes it's supposed to replace something that is outdated and incorrect now. Sometimes it's just like you have the 2022 report and now you have the 2023 report. Yeah. So the 2022 report is still okay. Yeah. But uh, do you have a way of training people on that? And then how do you avoid having just the uh, living room, you know, the hall closet yeah. full of just junk. The junk drawer, yes. Yeah. yes. What do you do with them? Um, so we have 500 individual microsites underneath this one umbrella, but they are all connected together. So all the assets and even the content is shared across the microsites. So I, uh, I was in the nc.gov group and they were talking about syndicating content. We do something similar, but rather than copying it across and you know whatever, I mean, what we do is if you were to upload that 2022 report, um, you can say, I can immediately, in that you can tag it to, you know, all these different microsites at USGS, and it appears on their microsite. It's the same report, it's owned by the one group. It's just, it's there on those places. And so, uh, when groups are creating content, like, uh, you know, we have a lot of science, that's, that's a lot of science work that's being done. Uh, they'll, they'll have one group that uh, will create the science project information and, and the results and the publications and everything, and then they'll just tag it to the different microsites, and it shows up on all those microsites. And so they don't have to repeat stuff, they don't have to duplicate content. If they need it updated, they just work together. Um, they just update the one, the one base of information, and it goes everywhere. Uh, so that's kind of our way to maybe help deal with some of the old content by not just getting it up there in the first place, uh, or, or keeping it up there, people you know, will manage the content hopefully on their own, uh, but they can push that stuff out to where it needs to go. Uh, it's, that's huge. I mean, even images, you, you upload an image, you can, anyone in the community can use it. Uh, they can you know, add it to a carousel, they can put it in an info block, they can add it to a paragraph, whatever, whatever it is. So, yes? Uh, I heard that uh, Atlassian is no longer supporting on-prem instances. Right. Yeah, we're in the cloud. And the FedRAMP strategy is a bit up in the air. How are you handling, or what's, do you have any thoughts? I'm not the one that buys the licenses for the uh, cloud stuff, but um, yeah, we are not in-prem anymore. Uh, we are up in, okay. in the cloud, and so uh, if you wanted more details about that, I could kind of put you off, but yeah, I don't know the details on how that, how that works, but yeah. Yes? We talked about um, reporting every year, um, just your stats and how your the performance and all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Have you had to report outside of you? Because it looks like the reports were in JIRA, like that was like a JIRA jet dashboard. Yeah. So have you had um, to report outside of JIRA using something else besides JIRA? And yes. So you know, how did you navigate the policy restriction about using data connection? So what we actually are doing is this, uh, we have an option here to kind of export out all of our work that we did, and then we just do a copy and paste into, um, right now I think we, for us, we use DOI talent for our performance, right? we think the federal government's moving to a more standard performance management system. So um, whatever that looks like there, we're just, it's basically just copy and paste. So we're just doing this option for us so that we can kind of get it uh, pre-made and then we don't have to kind of sit there and sift through all the work that we did over the years through email and, and things of that nature. Uh, we're not doing any sort of data connection between systems. Oh. Yeah. Uh, next. Actually, a little bit later. We still good? Oh, yeah, we're still good, I think. Um, yes? Um, I was curious, uh, kind of going back to any pushback you might have received, um, how did your team deal with folks who have yeah. Yes. So um, 
Anybody in our system, anybody that is a content editor or a content manager has to go through the full CMS certification and the Drupal training. Um, and the reason that we require that is because because these sites are so interconnected with you know, just create one, publish everywhere sort of philosophy, um, you can do a little bit of damage by sharing something accidentally to a bunch of different places that you're not supposed to. So we, we make them, if you have any sort of ability to do any sort of change of creation, uh, that you go through that full stuff so you understand the repercussions of what you're doing. And so we do get some pushback from that because from time to time people will say, well, I just need to upload a file, I need to edit a page. Well, you're still part of the same system. Um, we do have other roles that are a little bit lower down, so we have content reviewers that can just go in and look at stuff. We have people that can manage their own staff profile. We're one of the few agencies that have profiles for their, for their people. Um, they can manage that themselves, but our content managers primarily do that work for them. Uh, and so, yeah, there's... Okay. Uh, any other questions? If not, I'll be around till like maybe 3:45. Um, so, thank you. Appreciate it.